The following interview was conducted with Fred Ford, Executive Vice President and Treasurer Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, December 17, 2008 in Stewart Center. This is part two of the interview. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> um, there are several topics I want to cover that I didn't get covered in the first uh, go-round uh, adequately, I think, and they're kind of uh, mixed up, so they won't be in any particular order, but the first one has to do with the business office training program, and when Lytle Freehafer, who was then business manager and assistant treasurer, hired me in 1959, um, I was the first new college graduate that they'd hired in the business office, and I was sort of a guinea pig. And uh, at uh, a later date, a year or so, they decided they wanted to hire some more, and uh, I got involved in doing that. We developed a, a recruiting program to recruit uh, new graduates from a Big Ten schools primarily, but some other good schools like University of Miami and Ohio, where Ken Burns came from, my, who followed me in this position. And uh, we set up a training program, which was patterned after the kind of training programs that they have in business and industry. Uh, lasted three or four months, uh, covered all the areas within the business office. And after people had uh, gone through the different areas, they were given their chance to choose whether they wanted to go into personnel or purchasing or accounting. And of course, it depended a little bit on having uh, openings, but this was a point in Purdue's history where growth was very rapid. And so uh, they were looking for a number of people. and. Uh, this program uh, provided uh, talented young people, uh, people that we wouldn't have been able to afford to hire if they'd been out and had four or five years experience uh, in business and industry. Their salary expectations would have been greater than universities. But we had some things to offer for these new recruits that uh, they could expect to get uh, responsibilities of significant amount earlier in their careers in business and industry, and uh, a university environment's a pretty neat place to work, and lots of things going on that are exciting, and it's anything but repetitive, so fortunately we were able to attract uh, a number of people, and uh, some stayed with us, and some, after a few years of experience, went on to other universities. Most stayed in college and university business administration, so we have a number of alumni around the country. That uh, John Carnegie at uh, Florida State is comes to mind right away, right. and uh, that was has been a great program. Now the growth slowed and they don't do that so much anymore because they don't need that many people, but it served the purpose very well <coughs> in that the early 1960s through about 1970, 72 or three. Uh, following the instigation of that training program, uh, we also started a, a professional development program for the business office staff, and actually Lytle Freehafer started the first such animal when he created a business council uh, within the university that he, he appointed younger staff members to, and they spent a couple of years uh, identifying and, and addressing uh, problem areas that mainly cut across uh, division lines, so they were kind of problems that uh, were not easily solved or n were not going to be solved by other people uh, easily. And uh, that was a way to introduce people to the concept of the need for continued development. They all graduated from college, but your education is not over at that point. And, and we were, uh, we, we developed classes that people attended, uh, workshops, uh, 
And at uh, a later stage, uh, we uh, borrowed from Motorola, uh, where they were pioneering the Six Sigma uh, program of zero defects. And we thought that would be a good one at Purdue, too. And there was a retired executive from Motorola that uh, was really excited about coming to Purdue and helping us get that started, and, and he was very helpful. And uh, at a later date, uh, President Beering got interested in that and expanded it to cover the total university. So eventually the, the names changed and it uh, turned into continuous quality uh, improvement program and uh, did a lot to improve the uh, level of service that we provided uh, within the university and the quality of the people that were providing it. Uh, we provided uh, uh, professional development in the area of supervision. Uh, prior to the beginning of this program, uh, people were promoted into supervisory positions, but they had no training or background in many cases for that. And <clears throat> in our conference area, we had people from business and industry coming to Purdue to learn about supervision all the time. So we started out with our own programs uh, in, within conferences and uh, later expanded and developed some within the business office. And, uh, and we started in uh, on technical abilities as well, not just supervision. And at one point, we had all employees going through the program because uh, we figured people not only had to supervise, but people had to learn to be supervised and right. to follow. And uh, that was a very successful program, too. What was the length of the program for, the, for this particular one? Over a period of months or? No, years. Years, was years. it? Okay, mm -hmm. so it was a continual, ongoing a thing. Ongoing kind okay. of program. And uh, when I came, President Hubdy, of course, was uh, the president of Purdue, and he drummed into me the uh, doing things with excellence. And we kind of adopted that as a motto and continued to use it in our professional development programs to help people uh, focus on doing things with excellence. Uh, Lytle Freehafer uh, drummed into us the fact that Purdue University was a public trust and that uh, we needed to act w in a way that merited uh, support. And if people thought they could trust how you managed the state funds that they provided, we'd be more likely to get more state funds in the future. So mm -hmm. uh, integrity was a big part of uh, our program for making sure that everybody understood that that was a high expectation at Purdue and, and continues today, as far as I know anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds good. And <clears throat> These kind of activities of recruiting young people and, <clears throat> and then training programs and professional development programs led to uh, a clear policy of promotion from within. So we didn't do a lot of external recruiting when we had vacancies. We looked internal to the organization and we thought that provided a lot of incentive for our younger people because they saw opportunities to, to be promoted into higher levels. And uh, it also uh, lessens the risks that you take when you choose someone because you know the person pretty well. If they've been working here for three or four or five or ten years or more, as opposed to somebody that you may interview a couple of times that uh, you've never seen before in your life and, and offer them a high-level job, uh, there's a lot of risk involved in that. Okay. And, uh, Good point. It also provides continuity. Uh, we had a lot, we have historically had a lot of 
things at Purdue that were very traditional and we did things, we called it the Purdue way. And we figured it was a little better than other ways that people did things. And uh, you could continue those sort of things. Uh, uh, if you same. promote and develop from within, you hire somebody from another university, they tend to come and, and they look at problems and try to solve them the way they did at the other university. And uh, we think that the promotion from within has, uh, has served us really well. Uh, it, it's less costly. You're not uh, probably going to pay as much uh, even in promotions as you would in an external market. And there's uh, much less disruption to the activities because you can do it more quickly than you can if you have to go through an external search. Now, you couldn't always do that because sometimes there were talents that you just didn't have internally that were needed and then you had to go through a national search. But to the extent we could, we always promoted from within and, and I always found that that worked really well for us. Mm -hmm. Good. Another area that uh, I want to cover that we didn't uh, cover last time is financing of new construction. Um, when I came to the university in 59 and until 1967, as a matter of fact, all the academic buildings were financed with cash appropriations for, and <clears throat> uh, the state of Indiana was certainly not the leader in this area. Many other states had been using debt financing, just like very few people build a new house and pay cash for it. You right. tend to have a mortgage and pay for it that way. So, uh, in 1967, John Hicks and Lytle Freehafer, uh, John Hicks was the executive assistant to President Hovde and our legislative liaison, and Lytle Freehafer at that point was uh, vice president and treasurer of the university, and um, they recognized that that cash uh, limit was going to constrain our building opportunities in the future. So uh, they worked with the other four state schools and uh, we had uh, Ice Miller in Indianapolis develop a legislative bill that would uh, provide the opportunity for the universities to sell student fee bonds to uh, pay for new construction. And uh, the legislators thought that was a good deal. And, but at, at the beginning, uh, Purdue had to come up with the money to pay for both the, uh, all the debt service, that is the principal and interest payments. Uh, over time then, they started picking up the principal payments, uh, saying that that ought to be a state obligation. And, Later on, uh, we were able to convince them to pick up the interest uh, payments, and that became known as the fee replacement appropriation. It was a special line item just for the debt service, and the buildings were financed on a 20 to 25 year basis, so uh, those appropriations, they couldn't be guaranteed, so the the <clears throat> when we sold the bonds, uh, the credit behind the bonds was the trustee's obligation to charge student fees sufficient to pay the debt service. So what the state did then was reimburse the university for the fees that they charged that went to debt service. That's why it was called a fee replacement appropriation. Um, And those bonds uh, were considered to be uh, long-term bonds. Uh, some of them were short, but it was a seri bond serials issue and, and uh, spread out over the 25-year lifetime of the uh, bonds and uh, in equal 
annual payments. So just like a mortgage would be that you'd have to build a, or buy a home. Then in the 1980s, when inflation got so high, interest rates got high too, and all of a sudden, to sell bonds in the market, it was 12 to 13 percent interest, and uh, nobody was very excited about paying that sort of interest over a 20-year lifetime of the bonds, and and I uh, happened upon a scheme that. Uh, some others had developed, really. I didn't develop it, but it was uh, a short-term uh, tax-exempt commercial paper. And uh, we introduced that, and uh, we could sell that at rates that were very, very low, uh, 3 and 4 percent, when long-term rates would have been 13. And uh, since the state was picking up the the tab for debt service at that point, all the savings went back to the state. But we always figured it was worth it because they'd be more inclined to give us future building authorizations and bonding authorizations if we um, did a good job of financing and, and saved the, the state money. Uh, unfortunately, uh, all the universities didn't follow suit. Some thought it was too complicated. And, and it, it was complicated, and it took some continuous work because the the rates kept resetting, and <clears throat> you had to work with it. And it was risky. Um, it could have uh, gotten out of hand. Fortunately, it didn't. And uh, fortunately, at any one any time, you could uh, convert the short-term bonds to uh, to fixed rate. And uh, we did that a number of times when we sold variable rate bonds uh, when the interest rates were high, and then when interest rates cycled down to a low level, uh, we converted it to long-term debt. And that kept a balance between our long-term debt and our short-term debt. Mm -hmm. We didn't want to ever get all of our eggs in any one basket. And I'm happy to say that Purdue is still using that same technique. Uh, another area that we didn't really touch on last time was uh, legislative relationships. And uh, John Hicks was uh, one that was doing that when I first came. He'd been doing it for a while. There'd been people before him, but he was the current guy, and he was executive assistant to President Hovde. Uh, it was John Hicks and Lytle Freehafer who ran Purdue's uh, legislative relations program. Uh, uh, John literally lived down in Indianapolis uh, when the legislature was in session. And uh, <clears throat> to start out with, it, it happened every two years, so it wasn't quite so bad. Later, they started meeting every year, and <laughs> the the burden became a little heavier. Uh, but as a part of that program, we used to have uh, meetings with all the deans and vice presidents on Saturday mornings. Uh, Here on campus? In the, uh, in what now is Hovde Hall. It was the executive building then, and, and in the Board of Trustees room, which no longer serves as this Board of Trustees room, but it did then. And uh, Saturday morning was chosen because people didn't typically have meeting obligations, and, and that was time that everybody could be there. And it was a chance for John and Lytle to uh, bring the deans and vice presidents up to speed uh, as to what was going on in the legislature and find out what kind of uh, concerns deans may have because frequently there were bills that uh, we would read and send to the deans to look at because they affected uh, licensing procedures for pharmacists or uh, for teachers, for example, uh, or things that had to do with road construction and engineering and civil engineering. Uh, and uh, 
And then it gave the deans a chance to feel like they were on the inside of what was happening as far as our request for uh, appropriations also. And uh, so those were interesting days. And later when the regional campuses uh, became more significant in our total environment, uh, I started having Friday afternoon telephone uh, meetings with all the regional campus chancellors and vice chancellors for business affairs. And <clears throat> that gave the each of the regional campus people a chance to find out what was happening in Indianapolis. And then typically in, the legislators went back home on Saturday and, and met with various constituencies and Chamber of Commerce here and in many communities uh, hosted a, a meeting with the local legislators and businessmen and our chancellors and vice chancellors would go to those meetings and they'd ha at least have some background and, and they knew what the Purdue position was on various items so that we all spoke from the same page and that worked pretty well uh, also. Mm -hmm. Later, after uh, John Hicks retired, uh, John Huey uh, filled that position and, and uh, did a very nice job of continuing Purdue's tradition. And coming back to what I said earlier about integrity, uh, that was something that was very important to us in the legislature, that uh, it was uh, well understood that <clears throat> Purdue always told the truth, and <clears throat> sometimes it was good and sometimes it was bad, but we always told the truth of what was happening or, or what the conditions were. Or, and uh, both John and Lytle had impeccable records on, on this, uh, and I tried during my tenure to continue this because I agreed that it was very, very important. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, uh, I really was lucky in my tenure to uh, have a number of good mentors. Uh, John Day, who was one of my early professors in management, later became dean of the what's now the Cranert School. It wasn't Cranert then. Uh, was was my first mentor, and Lytle Freehafer became my second, and John Hicks and President Hovde, uh, which they called Prexy, <laughs> became the the next uh, mentors. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Francis Finn who had come to Purdue and purchasing, and had Remember been him. promoted to uh, business manager and assistant treasurer when I, just after I arrived, as a matter of fact. Um, and he was a very uh, creative thinker and, and doer as far as management practices were concerned. And, and he, uh, he worked hard at uh, faculty relations. Uh, and the business office and the faculty didn't always get along well. And, and he uh, pointed out the wisdom of improving those relations and, and did a good job. And it was Francis Finn that uh, came up with the idea of building what later was called Freehafer Hall uh, for the business office uh, functions and, and physical plant and uh, computing. And it was a unique building because it didn't have any internal walls. There were no offices, no private offices. It was all open. It was called Office Landscape. And originally created by a German firm, architectural firm. And uh, th there were a number of advantages because you didn't, when you reorganized, you didn't have to knock walls down, literally. You could just move screens around and and it had power and telephone grids in the floor, and uh, it saved uh, 
thousands and thousands of dollars uh, mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. So Francis Finn was another one of those important mentors to me and he uh, he really introduced me to national activities in, in the Kubo and, okay. uh, and the Central Association as well, uh, Central Association of College and University Business Officers called Kakubo. And uh, <clears throat> I was participating in them as a young neophyte, and he was in the upper echelons of these organizations. And lo and behold, he got uh, an offer to become the head of Nakubo in Washington, D.C., and, uh, and he took it. And so that opened up the position of business manager and assistant treasurer. Lytle decided I was ready for that, so again, without a national search, they simply promoted me from from within. And that's how I got really started in my management responsibilities. Uh, one of the other areas that uh, I hadn't covered before, and I I want to mention, is uh, reserves. It's always important to have some. Res financial reserves set aside for rainy days. And uh, R.B. Stewart and Lytle Freehafer had done that, and uh, I thought that was a good plan, so we continued it. Uh, you have to do this opportunistically. You can't always get some extra money to put aside in reserves, but you have good years and bad years on cycles, and, and in the good years you set a little money aside and you don't talk about it, you don't give it much publicity or somebody would want to spend it, but uh, it gives you the opportunity then when, when times get really tough, you can reach back and, and get some money out of the reserves and, and skate through these difficult positions. Yeah. And, University has never had to lay people off. We've not filled positions sometimes that were vacant, but we've never had to lay people off. And part of the reason is we've had those reserves available. The other thing the reserves do is give you the opportunity or give you the wherewithal when special opportunities come uh, forward to take advantage of them. And, uh, it's always important to have a little money that uh, isn't labeled, it's undesignated, that you can use. Uh, for example, in, when the economy goes into recession, uh, uh, contractors get hungry and, and the bids get uh, a lot more competitive. And uh, so we can get better prices on uh, particularly repair and renovation projects that uh, we always have on an ongoing basis in the university. And that, the last item that I wanted to bring up that hadn't, I touched on it before a little bit, but, uh, and that's the related foundations. Uh, my experience uh, in talking to other major universities, Purdue had more uh, related foundations, independent foundations, than anybody. And uh, as far as I can tell, this all goes back to R.B. Stewart and his creative mind. And uh, the granddaddy, of course, was the Purdue Research Foundation, which R.B. Stewart created, but with the money from David Ross and Joshua K. Lilly. $25,000 each, and <coughs> uh, all these foundations, uh, it was only the Purdue Research Foundation that had any people that were on the payroll. The rest of them were what you might call paper organizations, that is, lots of us were officers in those corporations, but it was just another hat that you wore, and you were not a paid employee from that. So we had seven or eight different foundations and when and they were created at 
different points in time to do specific things. For example, uh, the Ross Aid Foundation was created to build the Ross Aid Stadium and <clears throat> subsequently became a very useful tool uh, in the early days of the regional campuses. We financed all the buildings and the construction through the Ross Aid Foundation because they could borrow money. And the state had not authorized Purdue to borrow money, so we used the Ross Aid Foundation. And the university then entered into a, a lease agreement with the Ross Aid Foundation to lease the building that they built and to use it for university activities. So all of the original buildings on the uh, regional campuses were built through the Ross Aid Foundation. There was the uh, Purdue Aeronautics Corporation. At one time, Purdue ran a, uh, an airline. It was a charter airline, and uh, it was run through the Purdue Aeronautics Corporation. DC-3s and DC-6s, and uh, interesting time in history. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Purdue Alumni Foundation that was created uh, back in the uh, President Hovde days, and he, he, President Hovde didn't like to do, uh, didn't think the public universities should do f uh, private fundraising, but he thought it was okay for uh, scholarships and for uh, intercollegiate athletics. And so the Purdue Alumni Foundation and Court, uh, Maury Kanoi was one of the instrumental people that later was chairman of the board of Purdue. Uh, in starting the Purdue Alumni Foundation, and it uh, it served, uh, still serves a good purpose. There's still uh, lots of scholarships and a lot of support for intercollegiate athletics. And at Purdue, there was never any state money used for intercollegiate athletics. It was always private funds, and through uh, revenue, uh, gate receipts and so on, television contracts and the Big Ten contracts and, and through uh, the Purdue Alumni Foundation gifts and endowments. And uh, another foundation was the Indiana Purdue Foundation at Fort Wayne. Uh, it was formed uh, to bring Purdue and Indiana together to build uh, the first buildings on the uh, Fort Wayne campus and, and to acquire the land for the campus. So uh, it was uh, very specifically aimed at Fort Wayne. It had uh, <coughs> members on the board of directors uh, appointed by Purdue and uh, equal amount appointed by IU and an equal amount elected from the local people in, in the Fort Wayne area. And uh, it's still in existence and still serves a very useful purpose uh, for the Fort Wayne campus. Mm -hmm. uh, we might never have gotten that together as a cooperative campus uh, if it hadn't have been for that Indiana Purdue Foundation. Mm -hmm. So those are some of them. The Purdue Foundation now, we created that uh, when Art Hansen started the fundraising activities well, good at, at Purdue, good. and uh, the consultants that we had thought the Purdue Research Foundation, the word research, would turn some people off, and, and they wanted to give money to other things than research, and uh, they recommended we create another foundation to uh, be the, the vehicle for fundraising, and uh, we created the Purdue uh, Foundation. Uh, George Schilling was the legal counsel, and he and I wrote the bylaws and things for it. And it's uh, served a very useful purpose. Right. Uh, yes. again, and still going. Narrow uh, definition of its purpose, and it's still uh, the main vehicle for uh, private fundraising uh, mm -hmm. at Purdue. So. I just wanted to add those things. Good. Let me go there back are to some the others that we want to go back and 
expand upon. Well, I'll leave that out to you. Go back to the fundraising. What was the, but before that, before Art Hansen came, this is for the researchers, there wasn't really any fundraising per se going on at all? No. Okay. None except uh, for intercollegiate athletics and scholarships through the Purdue alumni. Uh, or the, jo or the jo was the John Purdue Club functioning yeah. at that time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and it was through the Purdue Alumni Foundation. Right, okay. All right. Um, I think we covered. Let's talk about the class gift, the gateway to the future oh, for the yeah. researchers. Yeah, I'll leave that up to you. Yeah, your comments. When your we class. talked before, it was yet to be built. Right, now, now it's, it's finished, right. and uh, and we've had it dedicated at homecoming uh, in October of '08, and uh, we've gotten many good compliments and comments about it. It's uh, I think going to be another one of those uh, uh, spots on campus that people uh, use uh, to show off the campus. Uh, at least I hope so. Right. <laughs> Were there many the main discussions on deciding on what your class gift was going to be that you're thinking about? Oh yeah, I oh. went through an evolution. Uh, it started out being that whole avenue, uh, stadium a uh, avenue, or stadium mall. It was going to be the Avenue of the Astronauts, and we were going to have busts of each of the 19 or so astronauts that are Purdue people. But when the estimates got over $3 million, we decided <laughs> that maybe that we're was too not, far in space right now. <laughs> not going to be something that uh, we could do. So we started focusing in on the front end of uh, Stadium Mall and John Collier, who was the university architect, was the one who came up with the design, uh, the conceptual design, and everybody liked it, and uh, so we easily made that decision. And uh, when we went to the final design, we made sure it stuck with John's original design. Sure. So looks very much like that. <coughs> Turned out my wife was in the class of 59 and I was the class of 58, so that was part of how we got together, but we also were talking amongst ourselves, cla the two classes, about these projects, and, and we decided we could do a bigger project if we did it together than we could if we did it separately. So right. uh, that's the reason we went together, and it's worked out very well, and besides the gateway, we've been able to provide some hundred plus thousand dollars in scholarship endowment funds. And uh, I hope and I'm going to continue to urge people to uh, make additional contributions to that class scholarship fund and, and have it grow. All right. Talking about class gifts, one of the unusual things that researchers might want, a lot of buildings here have names, but the class of 50, they kept, they didn't ever name it, they kept it at that. Well, no. that that is the name. That I is mean, that is the it, name, but that, oftentimes it'll always it does, be that. Yes, right. It'll always but be that. They'll say, and "Why it was is that? that?" Because it was, which is unique. The major, it was a class gift from the class of 1950, sure. which was kind of the tail end of the GIs coming back from right. World War II, and <clears throat> they raised more money than any other class has, either before or after that. And uh, Jim Blakesley was a, a member of that, uh, that committee that raised the money. I, I think Joe Rudolph was, maybe, and, and uh, some others. Um, and they really worked hard, and they raised over a million dollars. Now the building cost three million dollars, so we had to come up with some extra funding to to sure. make sure it got built. But uh, to recognize that class, we Very it was named the class of right. 1950 lecture right. hall. Right. And, and they also raised money, you know, for the uh, statue or the two statues that are That's right. included, in right. depicting students of that era. Right. Which is very, very nice, it's, very typical. It's a great classroom, it lecture is. hall. It holds over 500 people. It's got all the electronic uh, gadgets that people want these days and, <laughs> and uh, serves Purdue very nicely. Right, yes. 
And it, um, back to your the gateway, I should mention for the researchers, Armstrong Building is right next door, and right. Neil's statue is out there, and he's looking towards the gateway. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> they, so they can picture that. <laughs> they got to come and look at it. See? All right. <laughs> oh, now, for the final thing, and then I'll let you have make some closing comments, the Retirees Association, some involvement that you've had with them for the researchers, they might want to okay. benefit by that. Yeah, for a while, I didn't want to be too closely associated with ongoing Purdue activities and to let my successors do their thing. But uh, two of them have left now, so I felt like that was that purpose <laughs> was served. I agreed this past year to become part of the a retiree benefits committee, and we have a Purdue University Retirees Association, uh, and they have a number of committees, and one of them is the Benefits Committee, and and the main focus is on uh, medical and drug prescription drug benefits, which uh, they have helped negotiate a, a policy that's available to all Purdue retirees. The retiree pays the full amount of the uh, premium. The university doesn't pay anything on it. As a matter of fact, we pay a little extra to uh, cover the salaries of uh, some staff that, that work uh, in the uh, human resources office uh, to handle it. And uh, this is a hardworking committee, it turns out, and uh, we've just negotiated the uh, terms for the next calendar year and actually we were able to lower the rates, the premium rates a little bit, which everybody's enjoying. But because of all the turmoil in the marketplace and the, the credit uh, dislocation, uh, we decided that there might be a lot of people worrying about their pensions. Uh, that is TIA CREF, that m all faculty and, and uh, administrative staff have that are retired, and uh, PERF, the Public Employees Retirement Fund, uh, which is run by the state of Indiana. Uh, and so we uh, organized a forum, and uh, we had about uh, 350 people there, uh, mostly interested in TI craft, but we had uh, at least a dozen who were interested in the PERF, and, and subsequently I've had some telephone calls from the PERF people. And we had uh, speakers on a panel. Uh, Dean Kozier from the Cranert School gave an overview on the economy, and then we had people from uh, PERF that uh, made comments, and, and fortunately, uh, they were able to explain that there's no chance that their pensions are going to go down. If anything, they'll go up as, as they make adjustments from time to time on uh, for inflation, the so-called COLA adjustments. But uh, this year, because funds are so tight in the recessionary economy, uh, probably won't get any adjustment upward. But but they won't have an adjustment downward. On TIA and CREF, TIA is the fixed part of the retirement package, and, and it won't change much. It, it might change a little bit, but not much in terms of its payout to retirees. But the CREF portion will be fairly significantly uh, impacted because the market is down substantially. Twenty. 30. Right. Some places, sometimes it's been 40 percent. So we don't know how it's going to be the rest of the year and into next year. So uh, we wanted to forewarn people that uh, their CREF retirement income uh, would be going down and to reassure them that their TIA portion of their retirement income would not be going down, uh, at least not any substantial amount. Most people have uh, 
at least more than half of their retirement income coming from TIA, so they're in relatively good shape. Some people have all of it coming from TIA. Uh, some of us, like me, have uh, tried to keep part of it with CREF to offset future inflation because CREF has the opportunity not only goes down, it goes up. And uh, we've had times when it's gone up 20% or so uh, year to year. And uh, this year it's going to go down uh, a substantial amount. So the meeting was to give people an opportunity to hear from uh, the horse's mouth, so to speak, that their pensions are secure, that there will be some adjustments. They got some time to do planning. The CREF adjustment uh, for those who have annual adjustments won't take place until next May 1st, so they have time to start getting ready and <laughs> be prepared for it. Right, yeah. And closing comments, Fred, anything? Don't leave it what you yeah, like there, to share. There are a couple areas I want to expand on. Okay. One would be uh, investments. The executive vice president and treasurer was responsible for handling all investments of the university's portfolio, but but there was also a portfolio for PRF, and uh, and we managed that and. Purdue Alumni Foundation, I mentioned a little while ago, uh, as being the early fundraising activity for scholarships primarily, had a portfolio. So we had three different portfolios, and I managed those three with an investment committee, and we had the, uh, uh, was the business manager and assistant treasurer, but we had the uh, it was changed to be Vice President for Business Services and Assistant Treasurer, and he served on the committee, the Investment Committee, the Vice President and Treasurer of the Purdue Research Foundation, which was Wynn Henschel, and then later Jeff Wilson served on it. And the controller, uh, who was Jim Allman, uh, served on that committee. And then we had an outside uh, investment advisor, William Blair and Company, that uh, in Chicago, that actually R.B. Stewart hired back in his day, and uh, Lytle continued to use them, and I did too during my tenure. So they, uh, they served Purdue for some uh, 40 years. Uh, they're still doing some activities and in investments for Purdue, but they're not the investment advisor at this point, I understand. And we'd meet once a month and uh, they'd come down from Chicago and kind of review the market and then we'd go over the portfolio and they'd come up with recommendations for changes and we'd argue about them for a while and make decisions or decide to put it off for a while. Frequently President Beering uh, would uh, stop by in the meeting and uh, particularly like to hear about the market and what was happening. And uh, when we got down to the portfolio, stock by stock reviews, he usually quietly slipped out. But uh, he never said much. He asked some questions every once in a while. But he was always interested in it. And that was just his nature. Um, then uh, one of the other activities I touched on uh, before was the uh, fact that the Purdue Research Foundation had served a very uh, important role uh, for Purdue in the real estate area. And they managed all the real estate, mm -hmm. even that off campus, which the university owned. And we didn't own very much, but we owned a little bit. And they managed it on a day-to-day -day basis, but they they also bought properties as they became available in strategic areas. And uh, Wynn Henschel and I developed a master plan, which was very secret and very quiet, but it was properties that we'd like to own someday for the future of, of Purdue, future use of Purdue. And uh, in studying the history of Purdue, uh, David Ross 
I guess was the first guy that uh, got the real estate bug and, and uh, thought that Purdue ought to have more land and, and the university couldn't buy it or the state wouldn't provide the wherewithal to buy it. And uh, so he bought it and gave it to the university. And uh, that was very important. The university uh, has always had the luxury of having uh, land available to it for expansion. And certainly none of the forefathers of Purdue could have dreamed that the university would be as big as it is today. And 50 years from now, they'll say the same thing, or 100 years from now. Uh, so it's important, and particularly west of the campus, that. Uh, we have control over land and have land that's available. And then north of uh, West Lafayette, uh, used to be far outside of town, uh, there were the, the farms that were part of uh, the School of Agriculture operation, and the dairy farm and, and uh, other farms, uh, some 1,500 acres. And uh, the city of West Lafayette kept expanding yeah. closer and closer to the farms, and it was being constrained. Uh, a lot of the faculty and staff of Purdue live in West Lafayette, so it was to the university's advantage to uh, have places for them to live close, and uh, particularly the dairy farm and, and lots of people didn't get along well together. So we moved the dairy farm and the other agronomy farms and other activities farther north to newly acquired land, uh, using the Research Foundation again as the vehicle to buy it. And, and that the old land that used to be used for the ag school activities uh, became the land for the Purdue Research Park and and also then for Barbary Heights subdivision and the University Farm subdivision and some others that have been developed lately and a, and a couple of parks uh, thrown in to create a nice environment. So uh, PRF and, and actually the Ross Aid Foundation was partially involved in that same activity. Um, okay. certainly uh, has had a lot to do with Purdue history. All right. Go ahead. That's all right. We got five minutes. Um, on fundraising, uh, one of the things I didn't mention last time that I should have is that the wives of the presidents that uh, have become involved, and Nancy Hansen, the wife of Art Hansen, uh, was very much an active participant with Art in his early fundraising days and uh, uh, a full supporter and, and they, they did a lot of traveling and visiting with Purdue alumni to uh, get Purdue uh, into the fundraising game. You don't just decide you're going to get into fundraising and hang out a shingle and, and wait for the money to come rolling in because it doesn't work that way. And uh, they did a lot of groundwork and, uh, and they got it moving. Uh, as I said before, they created the President's Council and uh, we got a number of uh, very successful industrial people to, uh, like Ralph Bailey. Uh, to uh, participate in that. And <clears throat> in the early stages, uh, Andre Potter, the longtime dean of engineering, uh, was still alive and he was fully supportive and urging that, that uh, Art increase the membership up to as much as a thousand. Have that as a goal because we had maybe 300 or 400 members. Well, they have 17,000 members now, so <laughs> it's uh, meeting its goal from Andre's standpoint anyway. Uh, and then when President Bering started uh, in the fundraising activities, he raised things to another level, uh, particularly the sophistication of, of uh, 
and the social graces and, and everything, and, and Jane Bearing was very much a part of that, and she became a, a fixture with a camera, <laughs> and I can't even imagine how many pictures she took of <coughs> Purdue alumni in various activities at Purdue, and, <coughs> and she would get those developed and write little notes and send them to the alumni. So they didn't just get pictures, they got pictures and notes, and she catalog cataloged all those pictures, and, and that was a very important part of, of getting people uh, excited about supporting Purdue, because we didn't have that history. We, they had to work from ground zero. and. Uh, mm -hmm. So both Nancy and Jane need a lot of credit, and and I think I was not as close to it, of course, when uh, the Jiskies came. But Patty Jiskey has also played a, a major role, and uh, she was very much involved in in the fundraising activities, hosting and things, uh, activities at the uh, Westwood, right. uh, focused on fundraising, but right. okay. I think uh, Jane probably did more than anybody else. Right. Then, uh, yeah. One minute? One minute. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Let's go back then to um, Board of Trustees. Um, one of the things about Purdue that's unique is that the the treasurer of the university is also the treasurer of the Board of Trustees. And I don't know of any other university where that's true. Uh, sometimes they have two separate people. And I think it has served Purdue very well. Uh, I don't know who invented that or why, but it has worked very well. It, you, it's the same job, of course, but you communicate with different people. Uh, as treasurer of the university, you're reporting to the president. As treasurer of the board of trustees, you're reporting to the trustees. And, and the fiscal responsibility, uh, the trustees are, are the ones who have the final say. When we sell bonds, it's the trustees that sell the bonds, not the president, the right. trustees. And it's the treasurer of the board of trustees that signs off on those bonds. And so. From a legal standpoint, uh, there's a lot of responsibility, and from a fiscal standpoint, mm -hmm. and I hope that continues into the future because it served the university very well. Right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. This concludes the interview. Thank you very much. Very good.